Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. And we're going to start with verse 21. But for those of you that are watching this broadcast on the video, let me just tell you that it's probably, well, let's see, probably about five degrees above zero, I would say, right now, outside. Uh, very cold day here in northwest Montana. And we have a great crowd of faithful Liberty Fellowship believers and hearty Montanans that are here for our Bible study. Give yourselves a hand. Give, give, give a little money here. So I can remember a time when pastoring in another part of the country when a little bit of rain would keep half of the congregation away. And we have a full house on a cold Montana night with just slightly above zero temperature and that didn't keep people from coming. And so I just want you folks that are watching for wherever you are to know a little bit about the, the hearty people that comprise Liberty Fellowship. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about two people associated with the birth of Jesus that we hardly hear anything about. It's amazing to me, if you have sat under my ministry for any length of time, you, if you go back and, and look at many of the messages that I bring and lessons, you will, you will see that I try to take a lot of things from the scriptures that are mostly overlooked and bring out the, the truths that are contained therein. Because there just seems to be certain passages, there are certain stories, there are certain events, certain people that just for whatever reason are mostly unsung, untaught, unknown, uh, unheralded, even though they are in the scripture. So when you talk about the birth of Jesus, we're familiar with, with all of the stories that are commonly taught everywhere. But this passage of scripture that we're going to look at tonight and these two people that we are going to focus on tonight, uh, if you stop and think back as we get through it, how many lessons, how many messages have you heard on these two individuals? And I would venture to say that you have been in church a long time, those of you that have, and you probably have not heard much, if any, on these two individuals relative to the birth of Christ. And yet, they're in the Bible, the Holy Spirit saw fit to tell us the story, which means that it's there for a purpose, it's there for our learning, it's there for our instruction. We should look at it, we should teach it, we should pay attention to it. God didn't say anything in his word that wasn't important. If it's in his word, God thought it was important enough to put in his word. If it's not in his word, it's because God didn't think it was important enough to put there. And we don't even know what those things are because they're not there. So the things that are in the scripture, we ought to think to ourselves, you know, the Lord thought this was important enough to put it in the scripture. So therefore, we need to not take it lightly, even if it's something that may not be commonly taught, as is the case in these two individuals. Both of these two individuals are elderly. One of them, the age, we have a real good idea how old the individual was. The other person, we're not told how old the individual was, but it seems obvious in the telling of the story that this was an elderly person as well. So we, we are talking about two elderly people, which I think is significant because when you're talking about the birth of anybody, there's nothing that captures the attention of everybody in the room or anybody in the building or anybody in the family more than a newborn baby. We, you, we can all agree on that, right? I mean, a, a, a newborn baby takes the attention away from anything and anyone else and it becomes the focus of, of people's minds and hearts, which is normal and natural. Uh, there's, there's nothing like seeing a newborn baby and the joy it gives you and, and the fascination with life and birth and, and everything. And so it doesn't matter who we are, 
we will never get over that. We never should get over that. And not only are we talking about the birth of a child in our story, but we're talking about the birth of the Savior. So we're talking about the most important birth in all of human history, the birth of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the midst of that environment, with, with that focus, with, with the whole world and heaven's angels and the inhabitants of heaven all focused on the birth of Jesus, the Holy Spirit brings in two very elderly people and tells us about them which I think to me speaks volumes. It doesn't matter how young or how old we are. We are in, well, what happened? We are, something happened to the volume there. It doesn't matter how old or, or young we are or what, whatever the case may be, we are all important to the Lord. Well, one person agrees with that. We're all important to the Lord. And no matter what our age, there's something that each of us can do for the Lord. We're never too young and we're never too old to be able to do something for the Lord. And I think it's, there's something else significant about this. The fact that, that God would, would take these two elderly people and put them in the middle of the story shows, I think, the focus of God in trying to get us to understand to not overlook the elderly among us and the significance of their input into the most important things of our life. One of the things you young people are going to realize is the more you age, the less attention people are going to give you. You have that to look forward to. It's true. It's true. When you, and when you reach a certain level of age, it's, it's almost like you disappear from society. You walk in a crowd and nobody notices you. You have an opinion that nobody wants to hear. Society on the whole is geared to the young. The focus is on youth. And the older you get beyond that, the more insignificant normally in the average run-of-the-mill attitude of people, the less significant you are. It's, 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 it's sad, it's, it's, it's a shame, but it's pretty much the way it is. But that's not the way the Lord looks at it. And that's not the way we should look at it. People that are aged have something to share that you cannot get except you live 80 years, 90 years, whatever. There are certain things you cannot learn until you reach a certain age. So we are poorer if we neglect the wisdom and the, and the experience of those that have lived longer than us. There's a lot in the Bible about that. A lot in the Bible about elders, a lot in the Bible about respecting the elderly and, and how we treat the elderly, et cetera, et cetera. You look at the way a lot of young people act around, you know, do they stand, will they stand up and give their seat to an elderly individual? Most of them won't. Will they open the door for an elderly person? Most of them won't. Would they, would they give an elderly person uh, a, a a better spot in line or or whatever you know, most of them won't They're, they just 
like I said, the, the elderly, it's almost like they're invisible. That doesn't, that's not, that's not an insult to the elderly. It's an insult to the people and the lack of the character and training they have regarding the elderly. So in the midst of the birth of the most important personage in human history, the Lord Jesus Christ, in, in, a, in a situation when the birth would automatically consume the attention of everyone, God inserts the story of two aged prophets as it relates to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. I find that truly amazing. One was a man and one was a woman. So let's start with verse 21 and we'll give you the context of what's happening. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. According to the Jewish law, the male child was circumcised on the eighth day after birth. So Mary and Joseph are following to the letter exactly what was required of them regarding this child that was just born. So on the day that the boy is circumcised, that's when he officially receives his name. So they come on the eighth day after his birth, and on that day, he was officially given his name that the angel told them that he would have, Jesus, okay? So that's the occasion, that's the introduction to our story. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Okay, let's stop. The days of her purification according to the law of Moses. That would be 33 days after he was circumcised. Okay? So he was circumcised on the eighth day after birth. And then 33 days later, her purification is fulfilled according to the law of Moses. And she's now doing what the law of Moses requires. She is coming to the temple to present her sacrifices, her offerings to the Lord. This was prescribed under the law of Moses. And then that one of the passages is referenced here in verse 23. As is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, the reason that Mary brought the, these sacrifices, a pair of turtle doves and a pair of pigeons, was because she didn't have the money to purchase a lamb. A lamb would have been the sacrifice if one could have afforded it. The fact that she did not bring a lamb, but she brought the two turtle doves and the two pigeons shows that they were quite poor. And that is pretty much what she could afford. And so that's what she brought. And the law provided for those who were not able to bring a sacrifice that would be more costly as a lamb would be. And so in the law, Moses gave to the people those that could afford it would bring an, an offering such as a lamb those who could not afford it would bring the turtle doves the pigeons etc and both were equally acceptable to God so when when we give to the Lord we are responsible to give according to how we have been given to whom much is given, much is required. And that's why when God talks about the tithe for his people, which means the tenth, it, does, it doesn't really matter what the sum total of the offering is. 10% of 
$10,000 is obviously going to be a lot more than 10% of $100. But to God, it's not the total amount that you give. It is the faithfulness to give according to that which you are able to give. A person that has $10,000 or $100,000 or a million dollars is in a position to give a whole lot more to the Lord and his tithe would be obviously more than a person who makes much less. God is just as pleased with the tithe of a poor person as he is with the tithe of a rich person. And the rich person has no right to think himself better because he has given more to the offering when in fact he has been given more by God. And so therefore more is expected of him to give. So this whole thing of giving to the Lord is proportional to what God gives to us. And I have, the thing that I have found to be so amazing in my 40 plus years of pastoring, and it's, and, and it's not failed to prove itself to be true to this present hour. From day number one until I stand before you tonight, it's been the same. Generally speaking, there are exceptions, thank God. Generally speaking, the people who have the most give the least. And the people who have the least give the most. That is a fact that has been true throughout my ministry. I have seen it over and over and over. And the, the pastors that I've talked to throughout all these decades would say the exact same thing. People who have much give little. And people that have little give much. When people stand before the judgment of God and they're going to give an account for every dollar that God gave them and how they used it and whether they squandered it selfishly and whether they wasted it and they failed to give that which was the Lord's, they're going to give an account for that and they are going to be shocked when they realize what others have done with so much less than what they had been given and entrusted by God. Wealth, material possession, is a trust. It is an investment that God makes in our lives. He expects a return on his investment. He expects us to be faithful stewards with what he's given us. He expects us to use what he's given us. And the more he's given us, the more he expects. Here is a poor family giving what they could. But they gave it. They were faithful to give what they could. If they could have afforded to bring a lamb, I am absolutely confident that's what they would have brought. But you go back and read the law relative to this and you know that we're talking about the poor offering that God gave to Moses. So that's what we see here. That is the introduction to the story. So Joseph and Mary have come to the temple. He's been circumcised. The days of her purification are now complete. She's coming to offer her sacrifice according to the law of Moses. Verse 25. And we're introduced to the first individual who was the male. His name is Simeon. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout. So we are introduced to a man who is a, a righteous man. He is a just man. Here is a man. When you see that word just, it means you're talking about an individual that believes in justice. Justice is very important in the economy of God. And I don't want to get bogged down on this, but there's so many examples, especially in the Old Testament, of the importance that justice has in the mind of God. 
God places a high value on justice. And people that have a, a, a high sense of godliness also share that priority of justice. So here was a man, when he says just, he believes in justice. He was a just man, a righteous man, a good man. And the Bible says not only that, he was devout. He was dedicated. Uh, he was earnest in his worship to the Lord, in his service to the Lord, in his dedication to the Lord. So we're talking about a very good, just, righteous, devout, faithful man of God. We're not told how old he was, but obviously by the story we're going to see he, was, he must have been quite aged. The Holy Ghost, oh, excuse me, I missed the first, waiting for the consolation of Israel. That means he was waiting for Jesus to be born. He was waiting for Jesus to be seen by him. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And boy, that's important for all of us, that is that the Holy Ghost be upon us. The Holy Ghost is in us from the moment we receive Christ as Savior. But, but this is not talking about an indwelling so much as it is an empowerment. The question for us is not how much of the Holy Spirit do we have? Because we have all of the Holy Spirit. When we accepted Jesus Christ, he indwelled us. The question is, how much of us does the Holy Spirit have? That's the question. Are we surrendered to him? Are we yielded to him? Or are we stubbornly serving ourselves? And he is an afterthought. He wants to empower us. He wants to use us. We have to let him do that. He can only use a willing vessel. He cannot use a selfish vessel. He cannot use a rebellious vessel. We must be sweetly attuned to him. We must be sensitive to his will. We must be surrendered to him, asking him to empower us, asking him to use us that we might fulfill his will in our lives. So the Holy Ghost was upon him. So this man was such a man. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost. And this is amazing. He was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, <laughs> can you imagine this how many people would the Lord share anything with concerning our death has God told you anything about your death how you're gonna die when you're gonna die what's gonna happen before you die um, anything like that I mean the Lord just normally doesn't do that. The only man I can think of, and, and this I'm just thinking off the cuff here, so I'm probably overlooking somebody, but the only one I can think of that might remotely resemble this kind of an experience is Simon Peter. When Simon Peter and the others were talking to Jesus after his resurrection, and he was, he was talking to, to John, and he made a, a general statement, something like that, you know, if, if I will that he be alive when I come, or, and I'm, I'm failing miserably with a, with a precise quotation. It's in the latter part of John, maybe the last chapter of John. The rumor went around, you know, isn't it amazing that the disciples took what Jesus said and they made a rumor out of it. They were all Baptists, that's how I know that. Anyway, but John made it clear when he wrote 
the passage there in John. He said, not Jesus didn't say that I, he, he didn't use the personal pronoun, that th that the disciple would live until Jesus came, but if I will, if, if, that, if I wanted him to live until I came, what is that to you? You know, what I'm doing with John is, frankly, none of your business. You worry about what I'm doing with you. You take care of you. Don't worry about John. And that's pretty good advice for all of us today. Quit worrying so much about somebody else and worry more about yourself and what the Lord is doing with you. So that, that whole thing came about. And in the midst of that, Jesus told Simon Peter, he gave him a prediction concerning his death. And he didn't tell him the exact time and place. He wasn't that precise in his prophecy. But he did say to Simon Peter that it's twofold. When you are old, people are going to take you where you don't want to go. And basically what he was saying to Simon Peter is when you're old, you're going to be executed for, not, for my name's sake. You're going to be martyred for me. So it was a twofold prediction. One, he said, when thou art old. This isn't going to happen until you're old. But when it does happen, you will be martyred for me. So Simon Peter left that meeting with Christ knowing that at some point in his elderly years, he was going to be executed for Jesus' sake. He lived his whole life knowing that. Okay, that's the only one I can think of that Jesus in any way gave some kind of a, a pre precise, and it wasn't precise, but in some kind of a precise announcement regarding his death. That's why when you get to Acts chapter uh, 12 and they take Simon Peter into custody and he's in prison and he was awaiting execution and the angel came in to bust him out of jail. Right? You remember the story? What did the angel find when he got to Simon Peter's cell? He found Simon Peter sleeping. Could you sleep the night before you were going to die the next morning? Could you? I don't think too many people could. He was sound asleep. He was so asleep, the angel had to literally kick him to wake him up. That's how asleep he was. Question, how could Simon Peter sleep that soundly the night before he's supposed to die the next morning? Because he remembered that Jesus told him, when thou art old. So, yes, he had the knowledge that he was going to be executed for Christ when he was older, but that also told him that until that point, he was not going to die. So he had total faith and confidence in the promise of the Lord relative to his life and death. And he was able to sleep like a little baby knowing he was not going to die the next morning. And he didn't. Now, brother, that's faith. That's faith. And that's the kind of faith we're supposed to have in what God tells us. So this man was given something very unusual. So I'm going to be the only one I can think of that compares to it. He was told by the Lord that he wasn't going to die until he saw the Christ. He wasn't going to die. You can imagine what kind of, of, of life that gave this man. 
It also shows that his, he, and we're not told how old he was, but he, he the story insinuates that he, was, that he was quite early. Where was he? He was in the temple. Why do you think he was in the temple? Why do you think he was in the temple? He knew that the Christ child had to come to the temple in order for the scripture to be fulfilled under the law of Moses. You can imagine this man every time, you can imagine him sitting there in the temple watching as these young couples come into the temple with their newborn baby. You can, I can just see him. I can see him every time one comes in, I can see him standing up and waiting for the Lord's verification. That's the Christ child. No, it's not the one. How long had he done that? How many days? How many weeks? How many months? How many years? Had he been at the temple waiting for the Christ child to appear? We're not told. But there he was. And the story unfolds. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. You can imagine Mary and Joseph as they watch this old man take this child in his arms hold him up, bless him to the Lord, and say what we just heard him say. Which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. And then notice, notice his prophecy. This to me is, <laughs> these stories are just so incredible. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. His prophecy included the Gentiles, their salvation through Christ, what Jesus would bring to the Gentiles first. The Gentiles were not under the blessing of Abraham. To the Jewish people, the Gentiles were not considered part of anything relative to the blessing on Abraham. They were, now let's be honest, and it's pretty much still this way. In their minds, Gentiles are dogs. Gentiles don't even have souls. Gentiles are for, for the offscurring of, of society and of the world. The Gentiles, as far as their interpretation of the Gentile relationship to God, Gentiles don't exist. They don't have a relationship with God. They can't have a relationship with God because they're not under the promise given to Abraham in the Jewish mind. That's all they knew was, was the Jewish law and the Jewish customs and the Jewish promises and the Jewish priesthood and everything relative. To the, to the Old Testament uh, Jewish traditions and, and uh, customs and laws and everything. So at the birth of Jesus, he came unto his own, the Jews, and his own, the Jews, received him not. To the Jew first and also to the Greek right? But at the birth of Jesus, this old man who now is a prophet of God, the Spirit of God speaking through him, upon the first sight of this 
Savior, just born, says he's a light to lighten the, gen the Gentiles. First thing out of his mouth, he'll be a light to the Gentiles. He'll be a Savior for the Gentiles. First thing out of his mouth. And then, and the glory of thy people Israel. The in, in the Bible, I've told you this before, the doctrine of first mention. When you read any kind of a list in the scripture, whatever is listed first is considered the priority of the list. And that's true in both Testaments. So here's a list of two. And of the two that are listed, the Gentiles are listed first. <laughs> are you, I don't know, are you getting the significance of this? This is phenomenal. Joseph and Mary, and imagine the other Jews round about that would have heard this man make this prophecy. What? Did, that's heresy. What do you mean? A light to the Gentiles. And then the Jews are an afterthought? Israel is an afterthought? The, the Gentiles are the focus of your, of your prophecy? What? You're a heretic. I mean, you can... If, there, if, if you could imagine, if you could, just, if you could have been a fly on the wall that day, and if you could have seen, can, can you imagine if any of the, of the priests were walking by or, or were there or any of the Pharisees were around and they were always around? Can, can you imagine? Did you, did you hear? What did he say? I mean, this was revolutionary talk. And the Lord at the very first prophecy after his birth said that Jesus would be the light of the Gentiles. Phenomenal stuff. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. I guess so. Did you hear what he said? Yeah, Mary, I heard that. They marveled, could not believe their ears. And Simeon blessed them, Mary and Joseph, and said unto Mary his mother, all right, this is the second prophecy, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. This child is set for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. Because of this child, many are going to be raised to life. And because of this child, many are going to be destroyed in death. You know, that's one thing about Jesus Christ. There is no middle ground. You either receive him or you reject him. You either take him to life eternal or you reject him in death and destruction. There is no middle ground. Everybody that Jesus met was either lifted or put down in death depending on how they reacted to him. So don't think it strange and don't feel bad when people reject you when people turn their back on your message when your message is God's message don't be don't be surprised don't take it personally that people become angry with you or people will try to repudiate you or whatever I, uh, you know, mention my name in almost any venue, and you either got to pucker up or duck. <laughs> People are either going to want to kiss you or they're going to want to slug you, one or the other. 
That's the way it is with people who stand firm on biblical convictions. There is no middle ground. It's either yay or nay. It's either good or bad. And that's the way it was with Jesus. And this old man said, many in Israel are going to live because of this man, this child. And many in Israel are going to die because of this child. And all those Pharisees and all those Jewish leaders and all those people that rejected him and eventually scourged him and crucified him, we know where they are today and they are not in heaven. So it is with all. And then the second part of the prophecy, or actually unless you want to make it the third part of the prophecy, yea, speaking to Mary, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. A sword shall pierce through thine own soul. Well, we know, we know when that happened, don't we? When did that happen? When Jesus was arrested, beaten, and crucified. The women were at the, at the cross, included Mary, the mother of Jesus. Can you imagine, you moms here, can you imagine what it would be like to sit, uh, to stand at, underneath a cross and watch your son slowly dying to death? Slowly dying, that makes sense, slowly dying through crucifixion. Can you imagine the pain of it, the horror of it? This man said, the sword is going to pierce through your own soul also. And everything the old man said came true. And we're not told any more about him. He walks off the pages of history, probably... You assume that shortly afterward, the Lord took him home, and his mission was complete. God wanted him to live long enough to see that child. God wanted him to live long enough to be able to hold that child, to be able to make this prophecy regarding this child, to speak to those parents, especially to Mary, and then to give hope to the Gentiles at the very birth of the Savior. That was God's will for that man. Can, I think everything, whatever this man did, whatever his training was, whatever his occupation was, whatever his, his gifts were, etc., I believe that everything in his life prepared him for what he did in the temple that day when Jesus was brought in. The Lord prepares us for the tasks he has us to do. I can tell you that everything in my life, every ounce of training and experience and study and everything that has gone into the preparation of my life to this point, everything about it equipped me for what I'm doing right now in this place. Everything, everything was an equipping of what I'm doing right now. And if in the will of God, if there's things that God has for me to do 20 years from now, I'm being equipped right now to do whatever those things are 20 years from now. You are being equipped to do whatever it is God is wanting you to do at whatever point it is. And we will never know what that is until God gives us the open door and puts us in the place where he wants us to be. And then all these things that we were trained and equipped for and whatever will come to fulfillment at one moment. And so it was with this man. And he goes off into the pages of history and into eternity. But he's there, at the birth of Jesus, in the story of this season that we celebrate every year, right in the middle of it is this old man who becomes a prophet when Jesus came into the temple. Now we're introduced to the second one, and this one is a lady, and her name is Anna. 
And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, and she lived with a husband seven years from a virginity, and she was a widow of about fourscore and four years. I'm going to stop. Unlike the, the first individual, we, we know he was elderly, but we're not given a, a, a hint as to exactly how old. Not true here. For Anna, we have a pretty good idea of how old she was. We're told the chronology of her life. The age of virginity is, most Bible scholars would say, would be uh, about 15 years of age. She was married for seven years, and then her husband died, and then she was a widow for 84 years. So Anna was somewhere around 106 years old when this story took place. So the Bible says she was of great age. Yeah, I'd say 106 is a pretty great age. Not too many people make it to 100. And she was there as well. And she departed, verse 37, she departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. Now, we don't know what all this, this woman could do. Uh, most of the Bible teachers and scholars that I've read about this say that she probably had a house very close in proximity to the temple, that she purposely lived in that proximity so that she could go into the temple every day and she would pray, she would spend time fasting. Most of the Bible scholars believe that she probably also cleaned and, and did manual chores around the temple, that she literally devoted her life after her husband died to serving God in the temple. So she takes up a residence close. She, she's a prayer warrior. And I believe that God gives to certain people a supernatural gift of praying and intercession there are, we are all supposed to pray and we're all supposed to intercede, etc. But I believe that there are some people that God has just given that ministry of prayer. I don't know how many of those people are praying for me. I hope there are a few people who have that gift that are praying for me. I know when my mom and dad were alive, I know they were prayer warriors for me. I know that. My mom was a prayer warrior for me back from the days when I wasn't even serving God. There was a man at the Indiana State Prison that I met with my dad when he would go into the prison and I would accompany him from time to time when I was a teenager. And there was a man in prison who to this day was the most powerfully built man I have ever met in my entire life. He was in prison serving multiple life sentences. He had killed, I don't know how many people. He was, I don't know, six, somewhere between six, six and six, eight hardly an ounce of fat on him. The strength that that man had was intimidating to say the least. And in the prison he went by the name of Tiny. When my dad first started going to the ISP, which is maximum security prison of course, he won Tiny to the Lord. 
And Tiny fell in love with my dad. My dad introduced him to Jesus. And Tiny loved my dad. Tiny's mission in life after he got saved was to protect Ed Baldwin when he came to the prison. This giant hulk of a man who had nothing whatsoever to lose became my dad's personal bodyguard inside Indiana State Prison. Tiny put out the word to the inmates, if anybody, and there were a lot of people that hated my dad inside the prison. I mean, my dad told it like it was. If you think I tell it like it is, you never knew my dad. I am a softy compared to Edwin J. Baldwin. When he got in that prison and talked to those men one-on-one, -on -one, he didn't spare, he didn't shy, he told it like it was. And a lot of them hated him. And a lot of them threatened to kill him. And Tiny put the word out, anybody touch Ed Baldwin is going to deal with me. And everybody had the fear of God because of Tiny. But Tiny did something else besides just protect my dad. There were several of the inmates, my dad won hundreds and hundreds of men to the Lord. And there was a group of men inside the prison that dad had won to the Lord that rallied around Tiny and every day or every day they could, they would meet for prayer. And they they prayed for my dad. And then after I got right with God and after the Lord called me to preach and I went and got my training and then went and started our, our first church, my dad asked, asked Tiny, He said, will you promise me, because I'm an old man and I'm not going to live that long, will you promise me that you will pray for my son and get as many of the men as you can to pray for my son as long as you live? And Tiny gave my dad his word that he would pray for me every day and that whatever men were with him, he would insist that they pray for me. I have no idea. I can only assume just because of the sheer, although he was a fairly young man when I met him, if he's not already in, in heaven, he's, 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 very, he's very aged. I would like to think that that converted murderer has been praying for me every day since he told my dad that he would. I don't know how many people there are who have the ministry of prayer that are praying for me. I hope there's some still left. You better hope there's somebody who has a ministry of prayer that's praying for you. I do believe that I have one mentor on this earth left that's praying for me, my dear, dear, dear friend, Dr. Kenny McComas, who lives in Ohio, the best friend I ever had in the ministry. I believe with all of my heart that he prays for me every day single day and probably many times throughout the day. I don't know who else, my family, I'm sure there's members of my family that pray for me, 
more than I even realize. She had a ministry of prayer. And she had a ministry of service. Can you imagine this hundred year old godly woman coming every day to the temple, not only praying, but cleaning and attending to the menial things around the temple. Can you imagine that? Cleaning is hard work. I remember when we were at the other church again, you know, we had a large campus, large buildings, and a lot of acreage, and um, in the summertime, we always had to have a, a crew of men that did the yard work, cut the grass, plowed the field, did the, all the other stuff that needed to be done. And on the inside, it was almost always women that did the cleaning. And I remember it seemed like month after month after month after month, you know, I'd have to get up and beg people, we need help cleaning. We need help cleaning. We need help cleaning. We need help cleaning. We need help people in the yard work. We need, oh, everybody's too busy. Everybody's got this. Everybody's got that. You can't hold it. And my sainted mother-in-law, when nobody else would clean, she would be, along with my wife, out there in the bathrooms and in the auditorium and the Sunday school rooms and, uh, and, everything, and cleaning and cleaning and cleaning. And, and there were a handful of others that did, too. But cleaning is not easy work. Here's this old lady cleaning the temple, praying. I'm sure most people just walked by her every day and didn't pay attention. I'm sure people just got accustomed to her and took her for granted. And I'm sure that all those things were true. Didn't matter. Year after year after year after year, this sainted soul devoted herself to the temple and to the cleaning of it, to praying. When we get to heaven, folks, we might discover that most of what was done through any of our lives is more to do with the people that prayed for us than it was for what we did. We might find that out. Who's praying for you? Who's praying for us? They may be the ones that God is actually using more than he's actually using those of us that are, that are doing it. This is a godly woman. She's quite a, she's quite a woman. Departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant, as we are just reading about what happened, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him, of Christ, to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. We don't know how much longer she lived after this. But as long as she lived, what was she talking about every day of her remaining weeks and months, maybe, maybe years of her life? She was talking about Christ has come. The Messiah has come. I saw him. He is here. She witnessed of him from that moment on for the rest of her life. Hey, look, after we see Jesus and we see him in the eye of faith, amen, when we receive him as our Savior, can I get an amen on that? He's still here? What's our job? Our job is to do the same thing she did. Tell everybody that we can. Hey, we've seen the Messiah. We've seen Christ. We've met him. In the eye of faith, we've received him. Telling folks about him. That's exactly what she did. So in the midst of this wonderful story, relative to the birth of, of our Savior, the Holy Spirit puts the spotlight of history on two 
very elderly people, one a man, one a woman, and tells us the significance of their lives as it relates to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anna and Simeon. Whenever you read the Christmas story from here on out, I hope that you'll not overlook these two people and remember the impact and the importance of their lives relative to the birth of our Savior. Let's stand for a word of prayer.